Thank you for being here tonight. We're going to get started. My name is Kelly Petralia, and I'm a volunteer with Westboro Connects. Westboro Connects is an emerging grassroots organization in town dedicated to building connection, resilience, and kindness while promoting a community where everyone feels like they belong. We are growing, and we welcome new members, always. If you haven't joined our mailing list, you feel free to add your name to the list out on our table in the lobby. This program is a great example of the work of Westboro Connects to promote and host strengths-based programs that address the needs of our community and to do so in partnership with others. Tonight is made possible through a collaborative partnership with Rotary Club of Westboro, Westboro Youth and Family Services, and Westboro Public Schools. The first event organized through this partnership was Square One, a community conversation about substance use awareness and prevention that was held on March 28th. That evening, community members gathered to begin discussions about education and resource needs relative to substance use. Substance use. Tonight is a continuation of that and we are still just beginning. As a community, we can work together to build the strength and supports we need for all of us and we hope and we need community involvement as we move forward. One way you can be part of that tonight is to fill out the feedback forms you are given as you walked in. We will use those to guide us to next steps and we'll be reaching out for further involvement and input. We want to thank a few people for their help with this evening's program. Westboro Public Schools custodian Steve Ashley for getting us all set up tonight. Steve Masciarelli for helping us with the technology needs for the program. Westboro High School National Honor Society for help with childcare. And thank you also to Westboro TV for being here to record this evening's presentation for the community at large. And we are grateful to Eileen from the Worcester DA's office for bringing the Hidden in Plain Sight exhibit. If you weren't able to stop and check it out, um, it's about sort of the ways that kids can, or anybody, can hide things in their bedroom relative to drug paraphernalia and things. Stop on your way out. Um, that exhibit is there and pretty informative. Um, okay. We, um, yes, so I guess that's all. Thank you for your support and for being here. And now, um, I'd like to turn it over to Kara Presley, our Director of Youth and Family Services in Westboro. Thank you. Good evening. As Kelly said, I am Kara Presley. I'm the Director of Youth and Family Services for the Town of Westboro. And we are a co-sponsor of tonight's event. For those of you who know little about us, Youth and Family Services is a town department with a mission to provide counseling and social services to Westboro residents and to promote behavioral health and wellness for the entire community. Like many of you here tonight, we have a vision of Westboro as a supportive community that is responsive to the behavioral health and wellness needs of all residents. Our services provided to all people, people of all ages, are free and confidential and aim to be low barrier, welcoming and accessible. The licensed clinicians at Youth and Family Services provide counseling to individuals and families who have otherwise had a difficult time accessing services. Residents who are dealing with a variety of social and emotional issues, including family conflict, academic stress, substance use, anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues, may contact us for consultation for free about how to effectively address these issues. Youth and Family Services Staff provide the highest quality care, striving to be respectful, safe, inclusive, and professional in all of our services and interactions. Our staff are knowledgeable about area resources and skillfully connect residents to those resources to help meet their basic needs with food, healthcare, housing, and more. Our department also serves as a leader in behavioral health to the larger community consulting and collaborating with other town departments and organizations, advocating to address the mental health, social, and emotional needs of the community. Thanks in part to financial gifts of generous community groups, Youth and Family Services is also able to help sponsor large educational events like this one. One of our key collaborators in town is the Westboro Public Schools. I am pleased to turn over the microphone now to one of the leaders of that collaboration, in that collaboration, Roger Anderson.
Good evening. I'll be brief, and I'm lucky enough to be able to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Ruth Poti is a board-certified family physician and addiction medicine physician at Valley Medical Group in Greenfield, Massachusetts. She's a native of Western Mass. She attended Wellesley College, Yale University School of Medicine, and, and did her residency at Boston University, where she remained an assistant professor of family medicine for eight years. In addition to practicing full-scope family medicine, she is currently the medical director for the Franklin County House of Corrections, the Franklin Recovery and Treatment Center, and the Pioneer Valley Regional School District, as well as the chair of the healthcare solutions of the Opioid Task Force of Franklin County. She was named the Franklin County Doctor of the Year by the Massachusetts Medical Society in 2015. We were lucky enough to have Dr. Poti here four years ago, um, and she spoke to us, and based on her presentations, we took a, a bunch of the things that she presented then and, and blended them into our wellness program here at the high school. Um, we've used her data and some of the key points that she was able to make to continue what her program presented and embed that in, in what all of our students learned. And so we're very excited that she's back and uh, going to be sharing with us relevant things because the world we face around substances and addiction is a little different than it was four years ago, um, but a lot of the challenges remain the same. So with that, I present to you Dr. Ruth Poti. those great introductions and, and thanks for Roger for um, just sort of reminding uh, me that I was here four years ago because I don't remember this and uh, but also it makes me feel really uh, good that some of this stuff is being taught to the kids because the truth is I have kids in this room and kids respond to facts and data and information a lot of what I'm telling you if you've seen me speak before is going to be a repeat of what you've seen because many things about addiction um, do not change we're going to talk about how the brain develops really unhealthy pathways with addiction, how the brain breaks with addiction. And by the end of this, my hope is that many of you in this room could go take this talk and deliver it yourself anywhere you want. You may want to practice a couple times, but this slide deck is available to you, and Kelly will give it to you. And maybe Kelly in the back, a sign-up sheet. Whoever wants this can take it. You don't have to credit me. You can tell them you did it yourself. It's all good from my perspective. But we spend a lot of time um, as parents of athletes or athletes protecting our brain with concussion like you guys know as parents you're going to show up with a concussion the head trauma talk every fall right but you know this incredible organ ensconced in our skull is damaged in so many ways right and addiction is one of those ways and we don't spend enough time talking about how we can actually prevent this disease that truly is preventable this is one of the more preventable diseases that any of us can have so we're going to talk about the pathways that get disrupted with addiction of all sort, right? We're going to talk a little bit about screen addiction. And you guys, I don't know if you, how many of you were sitting there touching your iPhone, but I was. Like, I touch my iPhone all the time, right? A lot of us do. It's a real connection to us. Sometimes it's not so healthy, but we have this compulsive, continuous use despite harm behavior with our smartphones. Who, what adult in this room thinks they might have a problem with their smartphone? Yeah, it's a whole bunch of us, right? I'm not proud of it. Yeah, and it's gotten worse. Like three years ago, I didn't touch my phone like this, but it's gotten worse and worse. So anyway, just commenting on that. And your school district is doing a great thing. And, and Kelly, did you mention, I can't remember, about um, phone free or? Westboro Unplugs. Westboro Unplugs next week. And I'm gonna tell you, I think the adults need to unplug too. Unless you're on call, unless you're Dr. Botkin and you're on call for the hospital. Naomi is when I went to medical school. She's my first classmate. She's ever come see me talk. I'm totally excited. She's a great local cardiologist. But unless you're on call, put your phone away. Like, throw it in the lake somewhere. You really don't need it. You don't need to check your Facebook. You don't need to text anyone. It's fine. Everybody will survive without you having your phone. So I love that you guys are doing that in this district. So we're going to spend time talking about that. But before you go give your talk yourself, you're going to go back. You're going to look at the 2017 National Geographic. The cover said, physiology of addiction. How does the brain break with addiction? And online, you'll find all kinds of videos, but this is a great National Geographic article cover. They have a bunch of uh, video online. And um, for me, I was like, wow, the mainstream American magazine of National Geographic is covering addiction. Like, it isn't just about tigers in, in India. Like, it felt like a real shift for me. And so it's a great article. Before you go give your talk, you're going to go back and review this. But we're going to spend time talking about this really ancient, elemental part of the brain that tells you to survive every day. It tells you to get up, find food, find water, 
and send your genetic material forward because this deep reward circuit, deeply buried in the brain, is part of every cricket, every koala, every lead living being on the planet has this reward circuit that gives you positive feedback for doing things that keep you alive. That's the reward circuit of the brain. And it is this part of the brain that breaks when you have addiction. That's the problem with this disease, is it breaks this thing that tells you to live or die every day. And if we could scoot addiction and just put it over into the part of the brain where you lost your peripheral vision, and you went to the visual cortex and you didn't have your peripheral vision, I would get you special glasses, I wouldn't let you pitch on the pitcher's mound, and Jody wouldn't get to drive at night, right? Easy to fix, easy problem, right? It doesn't break that part of the brain. It breaks the part of the brain that tells you, I live or die today. And it is the reason why preventing this disease is so critical, is it's really hard to treat. For those of us, who in this room does nursing, medical care, counseling, therapy, works with people who struggle with addiction, right? It's a hard disease to treat. It is just plain hard. You see a lot of the same people again and again and again, and that's the nature of it. And I, I don't ever think I cure anybody, right? I just hold things at bay for them. So racing through this reward circuit of the brain is the neurotransmitter that we all know about, we all talk about, called dopamine. How does dopamine make you feel? Good. Super good, happy, euphoric, fabulous. Holy smokes, that was awesome, do it again. That's what dopamine says to the brain. It's a great chemical. Lots of us need more dopamine in our lives. Neurodopamine has with it two specific behaviors, compulsion and perseveration. I have to do this, I am unable to stop thinking about doing this. Those are the behaviors associated with survival. And your great, 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 greats were compulsive and perseverating. And that was awesome because they went to bed every night and thought, how am I going to find enough calories to keep my family alive tomorrow, right? That's what their job was. And they did it because that's why you're here. In my front row, they weren't so good, right? They don't hear anymore. Their ancestors were compulsive or perseverating enough. So these are really helpful behaviors when it comes to survival. They define addiction. Being compulsive and perseverating, the last thing you think of before you go to bed every night is how am I going to score some heroin tomorrow? That's the last thing you think of. It's the first thing you think of when you get up in the morning. It's way less than helpful behavior, right? And for those of us who manage people with addiction, I get super frustrated sometimes. I look at people and I think, I have caregiving fatigue because this is the 27th time I've taken care of you in the last six months and I'm exhausted by your presence, right? And I take a breath and I remind myself about these behaviors of compulsion and perseveration that they just keep cycling around. So at a baseline, we all have a certain amount of happiness in our brain, right? Some of us are a little high, some of us are a little low. And I would argue there's fewer of us that feel happy-go-lucky with a normal baseline of dopamine of 105 every day. Those are the golden retrievers of the world, right? And they feel good every day. We know who they are. My best friend is absolutely this. She, that is why she's my best friend. It's because she has way higher dopamine than I do. And I turn to her. She turns to me for a reality check. I bring her down a little bit because my baseline <laughs> dopamine sits lower. I think my baseline dopamine is probably 95, right? I do things every day that make me feel better. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave you guys. I have a couple hour drive, but I'm exercising tonight. I've had no exercise. I feel terrible. And I ate chocolate all the way here to stay awake. So I feel gross and I know what makes me feel better with my dopamine is exercise. What makes you guys feel better? Exercise too, other things? Yeah, getting a great night's sleep and cool, perfect sheets. Oh, that's yummy, yeah, what else? Yoga, going to yoga, meditating, calming down that like sympathetic response that's racing through your brain all the time. What else? The sun makes you feel good. Breathing, feel present in your body. Students will say to me, just listening to music, right? How good is that? You know, sometimes I'm listening to NPR and I think, why am I doing this? I can't hear it anymore, right? And I turn the radio station, I'm like, oh my god, there's music on the radio and it's nice and happy and super fun. It makes me feel better. You get a little dopamine spike. So we all need to be building dopamine in our brain in nice, healthy ways. So on average, we're sitting at 100 units of dopamine in this room, okay? And you find that perfect food that's going to keep your family alive and your dopamine will spike. It'll go to 150 and then it'll go back to normal. You have sex, it's consensual, your dopamine goes to 200 and then it goes back to normal. Because these are behaviors consistent with keeping your people alive a couple generations ahead of you. That's the point of the system, okay? The problem is when you use an addictive substance like cocaine, your dopamine will go to 350. You use something like a strong prescribed opiate or heroin, your dopamine goes to 500 to 900. You use crystal methamphetamine, it goes to 1300. So those are some amazing dopamine levels, right? And you would think, it seems like maybe a good idea to do crystal meth every morning because you get 1300 spike of dopamine, but we're gonna talk about why it doesn't work that way. 
So there's an equation in the brain that governs the amount of dopamine available. How much dopamine is produced, how many dopamine receptors are sitting on the other side of the synaptic cleft receiving the information, and how many little reuptake inhibitors or vacuums are sucking the dopamine out. Cocaine works in one way only. Just paralyzes the vacuum. That's all it does. It makes the vacuum not work. And when the vacuum's not working, the dopamine level goes to 350. You would think that this would be easy to treat because it has a single mechanism of action. And all we need to do is find a vaccine that makes the vacuum immune to cocaine. And then we would have a treatment for cocaine use disorder. And instead, there's no treatment for it. I just look at you and I say, don't use it. It's bad for your health. Stop, please. That's the best I can offer for cocaine, OK? The way opiates work is more complicated. They go through a mu opiate receptor, through a negative feedback loop, through the GABA receptor. But at the end of the day, every opiate makes more dopamine and it shoves it out there. So every addictive substance, every addictive behavior, at the end of the day, impacts something in that equation. It may take 14 steps to get there, but at the end of the day, this is where it ends up. Whether it's a gambling addiction, a screen addiction, an addiction to nicotine or to marijuana, it ends up here somewhere, okay? So the problem is that for 200,000 years, we have been in this human form on this planet. And your brain has gotten adjusted to a dopamine at a baseline of 100, and then maybe 150, and on a good night, 200. That's the way it's supposed to be. But when your brain starts seeing a 350, a 900, or 1300, your brain says, this isn't okay. There's something wrong. The volume's really high. I need to turn down the volume. I need to downregulate. The brain's response to these enormous spikes is to stop making dopamine. It erases 80% of the receptors, and it turns on every vacuum in sight. It's just sucking the dopamine out. So when you struggle with addiction, you wake up in the morning, you're no longer a dopamine of 100. You're not even sort of a sad sack 90. You're sitting at a level of 40, right? Your brain is saying, you feel terrible. You have dopamine levels in your brain that are not consistent with survival, and you know how to fix this. There's one way to fix this, so go make it better. And so you continue to use. You know, you search through your mattress for any nips that might have been left over from last night. You dig through the garbage in the bathroom. You're scraping things out of an envelope. You are desperate to feel normal again. People aren't getting high anymore, right? People with an addiction are just trying to chase normal, right? It's not a very happy place to be. What's extraordinary to me is that people voluntarily walk into a treatment center and say, I'm willing to sit here with you for the next 30 days and feel terrible. And my brain is going to be screaming at me to run because it knows how to get better fast. And you're offering me something that doesn't feel quite as good, right? But yet people do it. People do get better. They may have to do it 22 times, but they do get better. It's a hard process. But it makes sense to me why people relapse. It makes sense to me why people go back because they're trying to feel normal. I would do the same thing. So let me just ask, who in this room has an addiction to sugar? Yeah, that's a pretty big number of us, right? OK, who thinks sugar is good for your health? Okay, right. So a lot of us in this room, I would actually say that was like 40% of this room, have an addiction to something that we know is not good for us. Who in that room who had their hand up has tried to get off sugar? Yeah, and how long did you do it? A week? Two weeks? A month? You went off sugar for a couple years? Are you off it still? Wow, okay. Giant gold star for her. <laughs> Can I say not typical though? Many of us get off of it for a couple weeks maybe. And it was hard, right? Who, who got off it for a week or two and found it challenging? And then relapsed, right? Relapsed super hard. Like I relapsed with like the chocolate sundae, with like Reese's peanut butter cups on top. I relapsed hard. I know it's not good for me, it makes me feel bad, yet I can't quite help myself. So she's atypical and that's darn impressive of her. And, and the rest of us, I'd love to be in your ranks, quite honestly. I wish I could do what you're doing. So this leads to this concept of a broken brain, but I'm going to tell you about the way the medical system sees this, and quite honestly, the way most of society sees this. This guy lives in Westboro. It's 5.30 in the morning. He's having substernal chest pain. He's rubbing his sternum, and his wife looks at him and says, you look bad, and he says, I don't feel so good. And she says, I'm calling an ambulance, right? And I got Westboro police, fire, EMS, they're there. They're in his living room in like 17, seven minutes. They're there. And they look at him and say, you're having a heart attack, dude. And they give him a subliminal nitroglycerin and a beta blocker and they give him an aspirin and put in a big worry. And they transmit that EKG to Metro West. And Metro West says, bah, 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 bah. nope, nope, don't send him this direction. Wrong direction. Out to UMass, right? Call the big campus at UMass because this guy's having a massive interior wall MI and he needs to have bypass. So this guy is in the operating room in an hour and a half, and he gets, I don't know, four new vessels in his heart. And then he goes to the post-surgical uh, floor for another week, and then he's gonna be on telemetry for another week. He has a couple little hiccups. He gets depressed, because these guys with a heart attack, they all get depressed. 
And then he goes to 12 weeks of cardiac rehab at Metro West. How much money did we just spend on him? Yeah, a quarter of a million. I think that's about the right answer. We stayed in Central Mass. I didn't ship, ship him off to MGH, right? We stayed local. That was good. But at least a quarter million, I think, we just spent on him. His next door neighbor in Westboro is this 24-year-old kid. She went to this high school. She's smart. She's a soccer star. She had a little anxiety, but she powered through it. In her sophomore year at Boston College, where she had a soccer scholarship, she had an ACL tear that was really severe of her knee. She couldn't play. She had a couple surgeries, but she just couldn't get better. She couldn't get better with rehab. She, she was off the team. She lost her scholarship, and for her, she lost her career. She lost her ability to be at BC. And the only time she felt better is when she took the oxycodone that the orthopedic surgeon gave her. It's the only time she felt happy again. And she kept going back to that orthopedist, and after about six weeks, that guy was like, I don't know what's up with you, but cutting you off, right? So she began buying pills on the street, and within short order, she realized she couldn't afford pills on the street, so she converted to heroin. Initially, she was snorting it, and then she began injecting it. The last three years for this kid have been completely off the rail. She's been a wreck. She's been doing things that no one ever, including herself, would have thought she could ever possibly do. She's been homeless. She's been hanging out with the roughest of crowds. She's been arrested a couple of times. Things have not gone well for her. But about nine months ago, she moved back home here to this town, back in with her mom, who's been incredibly supportive. She's a new therapist. She's going to yoga. She's going to a local Suboxone clinic run by UMass. She's going to AA meetings. She's exercising, again, in a way that's allowing, allowing her to feel normal without being a collegiate athlete. She got a job. She has a sense of purpose. She got paid yesterday. Things are good, right? But this morning at 5.30, when her mom knocks on that bathroom door and finds it locked and no response behind it, that mom freaks out, kicks the door, and finds her daughter lying on the ground, blue and not breathing. And that mom does what you're supposed to do. She calls 911 first, she starts CPR, and then she administers the overdose drug naloxone, also called Narcan, but her daughter doesn't come back. And by that time, I've got Westboro police here. I've got two patrol cars, they each have two vials of Narcan. It takes five vials of Narcan for this young woman to come alive again, right? And they bring her to the ER at Metro West, and what, what happens for her? Seen and discharged, right? Released. They probably gave her a big dose of shame and blame while she was there, but that was about it. Okay. I didn't tell you the whole story about her next door neighbor, that 68 year old guy who just had a massive heart attack, just spent a quarter million dollars on him. So he's 68 years old. Both of his parents had significant cardiovascular disease. His mom had a stroke in her early 70s. Her, his dad had a heart attack and died in his 50s. He smokes about a pack a day. He's cut back. He used to be two packs a day. He's down to eating one pack, which is pretty good. Um, he kicks back, I don't know, 12 pack of beer most days, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. He goes to McDonald's at least four times a week. He would go more if his wife didn't know about it. So does this guy have addiction? Uh-huh, and what's he addicted to? Yeah, tobacco. Probably alcohol, 12 pack, that's a lot of beer. And carbs, carbs, sugar, fat, chemicals that are in McDonald's food, whatever that is, but that is a super addiction. I mean, we can acknowledge that. Did he create his heart attack? Yeah, I mean, he, so somebody said he contributed. Um, he definitely contributed. So the number one killer in our country is tobacco. The number two killer in our country is lack of exercise and poor diet, and number three is alcohol. He partakes in the top three killers in our country. I would argue he created his heart attack, right? I know I gave you some genetic risk, but his parents were both smokers. You get rid of smoking, nobody in that family had cardiovascular disease. They were all fine, but they smoked, and smoking kills you. So this guy is an addict, right, who actually created his disease, for which the Commonwealth just spent a quarter million dollars. But did anybody roll into his living room or in the ER or in the cardiac care unit and say, you know what, you are, you're an addict and I'm not going to provide medical care for you. Did anybody do that to him? Anybody shame him and blame him, make him feel like a piece of dirt? We provided him world-class medical care because that's our job. Our job is to take care of the sick and the suffering, period, right? I may not always love what my patients are doing. My job is to sit with them and try to help them move slowly along a path of improvement. I don't expect any of my patients to drop 100 pounds and disappear their diabetes or hypertension. That's not my expectation. In a wonderful world with a magic wand, I would do it every day, but that's not the world where I practice. I encourage people to live well. Every now and then I get somebody who shocks me and they've erased their diseases by uh, starting to do things that are extraordinary. But it's not common, quite honestly. And that's true for every one of us. Who in this room is perfect, right? 
I have a vegan marathon runner somewhere in this room. Where is it? It's kind of my no sugar gold star. Are you a marathon runner too? Okay. My point is, is that none of us are perfect, right? We all do things we know are not great for our health, but we do the best we can. Most of us are really trying the best we can. And what bothers me in this world, and the reason I do this work as a doctor, right? I'm a normal family doctor. The reason I do this work is this right here is so outrageous to me. It is so unfair, it is unjust, it's immoral. And you know what needed to happen to that girl? You know what need, you know how much money we needed to spend on her? Zero dollars. I needed a nurse or a ward clerk or a resident to say, holy smokes, I talked to your mom in the waiting room. She told me how great you've been doing. You've been great for the last nine months. I'm really proud of you. And you know what we know? Relapse is common. When do you relapse? When you start to feel good again. Somewhere between 6, 12, 15 months, you feel so good that you think you can dip your toe back in because you've got this. But you don't cut this. That's the problem, right? In these days, right, we have fentanyl everywhere. There's no more heroin left in Massachusetts. It's all fentanyl. You use once, and you are dead. So we're living in a world in 2019 that has flipped totally, 180 degrees. It's become incredibly dangerous to relapse. It's really a ter terrifying time for those of us who take care of people with addiction. They needed to say, this is normal what happened to you. I'm worried about you. Your mom is terrified. We need to get a few more things going your way. My guess is you just got a job, which means you probably have pulled back on therapy and meetings, right? I also know you just got paid yesterday. And you may not be able to manage your own money right now. So could I just have a conversation with your mom and you about maybe your mom manages your money and you get a couple, three dollars a day for coffee? Is that reasonable? Can we have that conversation? Done. Right? Nobody needed to make her feel like a piece of dirt. They needed to give her a, a bigger safety net. That's all. That's what needed to happen to her. And until this equalizes, right? Until this becomes the same care provided in every hospital in this country, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And you know who's changed on addiction? Police officers, school resource officers, uh, courts, jails have even changed. Not Worcester County. Your jail needs some work. I'm going to say that to you. Who are you guys know who your sheriff is? You do. Jody knows, but does everybody know who your sheriff is? I'm telling you, Worcester County jails have some work to do when it comes to helping people with addiction. You guys are behind the times. There's 13 counties, 14 counties in the state, and there's some counties that are doing a great job. I'm, I'm from this county. I get to be mad at my little county. We have some work to do. And next time you see the sheriff running for office, I need you to ask the question, what are you doing to help people struggling with addiction who are in your facility? Because there's not a lot happening right now in Worcester County. Hmm. When I talk to judges, I say, don't sentence them to Worcester County. Sentence them to a place where they're going to get treatment. So uh, there's a little shout out for me. I don't care if the sheriff gets mad at me. But I, you can't fire me from my job. So, Okay. So let's go back to the science of dopamine. That middle column is a healthy brain. That's a lot of us in this room. We have orange dopamine racing around everywhere, and that's great. Um, and the brains that are over to the far right are people struggling with addiction. And that top one is cocaine, the next one down is meth, third one down is alcohol, and the next one is alcohol. That meth brain, extremely unhealthy. I can't tell you how hard it is to help people who struggle with a methamphetamine addiction. There's a tremendous amount of brain addiction, or brain destruction. Some people, I think, actually don't ever get better. Um, look at the alcohol brain. Do you see a little orange on that slide? Alcohol is an interesting one. It takes a little while for the wheels to fall off that bus. It takes a while before you get your third OUI and you lost your license and lose your job. It takes a while before your husband walks out on you. Um, it takes a while before your life falls apart. And that's because alcohol is a little bit slower in its destruction. There's a lot of us who are functional alcoholics. We work with functional alcoholics. I will not underplay the harm that alcohol has in our society. It has significant harm, right? It's legal, it's sold everywhere, and lots of us drink, but it can be really a harmful substance. I, I have no belief that there's any health benefit to alcohol. I've had people come to me, they're like, I drink wine, I don't need to be on a, on a lipid lowering drug. And I'm like, oh, I don't know who told you that, but I'm telling you the health benefits of alcohol have been hugely overstated. And any study that says it's good, figure out who funded it, it's largely funded by the alcohol industry. Get rid of those studies, there's not much health benefit to alcohol. So there's three things that are set up for developing the disease of addiction. The first one is genetics, the second one is early exposure while your brain is developing, and the third one is a history of childhood trauma. Having poor mental health is not necessarily a part of addiction. It's that you self-medicate when you're struggling with anxiety, depression, or another mood disorder. And so when you're a 15-year-old kid and you're crawling out of your skin with anxiety and you think to yourself, the only thing that makes me feel better is when I drink 
or when I bake my THC product in the school bathroom, that's the only thing that makes me better. You are a 15 year old who's exposing your brain to an addictive substance in order to self-medicate. That's what causes the disease of addiction, not the mental health disorder. And I think you guys know this, and I actually think Westboro is probably doing a tremendous amount of work on mental health disorders. Our kids are struggling with epidemic levels of anxiety and depression. Who, who thinks that's true in your own household? Yeah, I mean, it's crazy, right? And, and you know, you're, you need to pay attention to your kids. And, and sometimes, I have one, I mean, all of my kids have struggled, but I have one of my kids who's just super quiet. I spend all my day worrying about her because she just doesn't talk. And I, she probably thinks I'm crazy. I, I feel like I ask her every day how her mental health is. We have got to make sure our kids are getting the resources they need, really good therapy, tons of physical exercise. We should be piping in meditation over the PA system in every public school. Right? Our kids should be meditating every single day. They should be doing yoga. Like We need to change it up because these kids are suffering tremendously right now. It's not okay, and it's very different from whenever you guys went to high school for my adults in the room. So the genetics of addiction are huge. It is very hard to find a disease that has this level of genetics. If you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of having addiction yourself. So who needs to hear that from you? Your kids need to know what their genetic risk is. They need to know this from you. I have kids that come to me, they're 15, and they're like, my great aunt had colon cancer, and I'm like, I don't care. Irrelevant to the story, right? And I think to myself, what you don't know, my lovely 15-year-old, is I know everybody in your family, and how is it that you don't understand or know what's really coming at you, which is a, family, a very strong family history of addiction, right? And I think it's really hard for parents to think, I don't want to have to tell my kids about my dad, right, their paternal grandfather. But the reason you tell them, you don't have to tell who and what and exactly what happened. You don't need to go into those details. Is because actually, although your kids don't get to change their genetics, they don't get to change their parentage, they can actually make decisions so well that they can almost erase the genetics. They actually get to drive this bus, as long as they have the information up front. That's the amazing thing about this. Because what we know about addiction is that it is considered a developmental pediatric disease. It starts while your brain is developing. It just does. If you get to the age of 24 and you haven't used an addictive substance, you're not using nicotine, you're not using marijuana, you're not drinking, the likelihood of developing addiction is about 2%. Even if you have bad genetics. If you have bad genetics working against you, you started off at 50% and you just delay your use, the rates of addiction go down to 5%. You started at 50, you were well informed, your parents said to you, you are vulnerable, you're more susceptible, you need to postpone. You need to postpone as long as possible. You bring this risk down to 5%. Holy smokes, that's why you tell your kids, is they get to change the outcome. That's amazing. You don't get to change your outcome very often, but with this, you do. So when you're 15 years old and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two alcoholic beverages a week, 40% of those 15 year olds go on to be alcoholics. You wait till age 21, 7% go on to be alcoholics. Right? You think about the difference between a 15 year old and a 21 year old. Like there's a big difference between that. It's just about delaying use, right? I don't look at my kids with my huge glass of wine and be like, don't ever drink, it's gonna kill you, right? I think that's a stupid method. I say to them, you three sitting in front of me are at high risk for addiction, you need to delay your use as long as possible. You cannot be the kid that shows up at the after homecoming party at the age of 17 drinking. You cannot be using marijuana, right? Don't ever smoke. I will never say to you, start smoking after the age of 24 or 25. Don't ever smoke, it's the number one cause of death in our country. So it's just about delaying use. And you know who does a terrible job with this? Colleges and universities. It's like a free for all when you hit college, right? Who has kids in college? Right, I don't know, have you guys ever walked into the dorm? I walked into my kid's dorm like at 11 in the morning on a Tuesday and I'm like, holy smokes, the pot smell in the dorm on a Tuesday at 11? You know how much money I'm paying for this place? Are you kidding me? Right, has anybody else had that experience? Yeah. There's a lot of marijuana use, there's a lot of drinking uh, going on at college. And I'm, I'm more and more ticked off at our colleges and universities that they're not actually doing more work on prevention. Because those are not developed brains, right? Those are 18 year olds. Okay, so you know what about our kids? It's amazing. Our kids are actually are amazing. They're making great decisions. They're making way better decisions than those of us over 40 did. I can't say that strongly enough. If I, I don't have tons of kids in the room, but I'm gonna just look at you two right there. What do you guys think of cigarettes, paper cigarettes? Yeah, gross, bad, yeah. They're like, yeah, no thanks, right? When you ask a room full, this room were full of high school students, 
What they say is they're disgusting. That's the number one I get word I get. Disgusting, revolting. I've had kids from the back be like, they cause bladder cancer, they paralyze the cilia and your lungs and your sinuses. And I think to myself, holy smokes, you got the public health message on this one, right? <laughs> this generation right here, it is and was possibly only was gonna eradicate tobacco and nicotine addiction. They were gonna get rid of it, right? The rates of smoking was down to like three percent. This generation, I had I gave this talk actually at my little local school just a couple days ago, and I asked a couple girls in the back, I said, do you know who Joe Camel is? And they were like, no, and I thought, they don't even know who Joe Camel is. How good is that, right? I don't want any, Joe Camel's disgusting. I hate Joe Camel. But this generation is so smart. And as the sense of harm went up with cigarettes, use went down. That's what it did. But here's the problem. The sense of harm with marijuana is super low. And as the sense of harm with marijuana has gone down, not just with our kids, but with everybody, sense of harm, it's all good, it's all good all the time. The sense of harm has gone down, use has gone up. So what do people say about pop? It's natural, it's organic, it grows in the ground. What else? It relaxes me, it helps me, it helps me sleep, it decreases my anxiety, it helps me perform better. I'm better in class, I'm better in soccer when I'm high. Unbelievable, right? What else? It's not addictive. It's not addictive. They'll say exactly what you said. Some people think it's not addictive. It is legal over the age of 21 in the state of Massachusetts. So far, that's the only thing you guys have said that I think that's true. Okay, what else? <laughs> Has anybody ever heard... A kid say it's better than alcohol. There's often a direct comparison to the other legal drug out there. And, it, and it's part of the argument, right? Is that alcohol's there, I can walk into a liquor store and buy alcohol, why shouldn't I use this? So there's always that comparison. Anything else you guys can think of? Exactly right, it won't kill you. That's exactly right. Okay, so you guys got everyone because you guys are super smart. So this is the average list that most people will say to me and you guys covered them all. So let's talk about it. There's three things that happen to the brain sitting in this high school and in the middle school. Between the ages of 12 and 24, absolutely critical things are happening to the brain. Now, uh, things are happening to the human brain uh, the whole time, right? My brain is just degenerating and atrophying and losing memory. That's what's happening to my brain at the age of 50. But you guys know I had a baby today, a six-month-old in my office, and, and that baby was so different than he was when he was four months old. Like, the a world of person was talking, was rolling, was laughing. Like, that is a totally different brain, right? But brains do not stop developing. And in fact, really amazing things happen during middle school and high school. And if, the first thing that happens is something called synaptic refinement. You have tens of billions of these wired synapses racing through your brain. And that brain is a hot tangled mess. And in fact, that brain, at the age of 12, needs some fine tuning. And what must happen during adolescence is you need to prune it back. You can lose as much as a third, sometimes as much as a half, of everything in your brain during adolescence, and you need that to happen. You need that hot, tangled mess to get really organized. There are times during adolescence where you are losing 30,000 synapses a second. Sometimes I'm looking at my 15-year-old, I'm thinking, you're losing them in front of me right now. <laughs> So this happens during teenagehood. The second thing that happens is myelination. So in sheathing these really rapid pathways in the brain that are like super highways making good decisions, right? This has to happen. If this doesn't happen, you have a kid who does not have a healthy brain. You have a kid who likely has a very, very major psychiatric illness. This has to happen. You want it to happen well to the best of your ability as a parent. So our kids' brains, are amazing. They're amazing. And they're doing everything right. They're all about looking that there's no walls, no ceilings. They're pushing the limits. There's terrible impulse control. It's all act first, think later. Very strong sensation seeking. Lots of physical activity. Um, incredibly in, uh, impacted by their peers, right? Hugely impacted by their peers. The emotional spectrum with a teenager, huge. Totally huge, again, back to me and my girls at home right now. I can walk in the door and one of them's like, hi mom, you look pretty today, I love you. And then seven seconds later, screaming at me and crying. I haven't opened my mouth, I have not put down my book bag, right? And I think to myself, holy smokes, what just happened? And then I remind myself, oh, the teenage brain, that's what just happened, this is kind of normal. It makes me crazy, but it's sort of normal. So, this is the brain, and they're great. So, a couple things on it. Strongly influenced by friends and peers in a very strong hypersensitivity to social exclusion. This defines adolescence. 
the tolerance for being excluded is close to zero. And I want you guys to pause and just think about this for yourself. So I think about it a lot myself. But when you were seven years old and in second grade and by yourself at the cafeteria eating your PB&J, you were like doodling on a napkin and you didn't care. And when you had your first job at the age of 23 and you're sitting by yourself reading the New York Times on your phone eating your salad, you don't care. But when you are 14 years old and you're sitting in this cafeteria by yourself, the entire universe is watching you and you're wondering, is it my hair? Is it what I wore? Do I smell that? Is that stupid thing I said during math? It's because I didn't get a field hockey goal. What's wrong with me? The entire world is watching you and you're asking yourself, what is wrong with me? and Why am I not being included? Because guess what? Being a teenager is really hard. It just is. It has this definition of the looking glass self. I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. That defines adolescence. And it's one of the reasons why most of us as adults wouldn't go back and do this again, because it's not easy. I would love to go back as, in this form and kick some butt in middle school. You have to do that, right? You have to go back and relive it as you were. And this part of you is not an easy place to be. And if I have an adult in this room that still thinks like this, you need a therapist. You need to talk to my great person over there, to Kara, and she's going to find you a therapist, because this, you have to grow out of this. It's really important for this to happen. And I'm telling my teenagers in the room, it gets so much better than adolescence. And caring so much about what other people think of you, you're going to grow out of that, and it's going to be a good moment when it happens. But it's the reason why our kids are like, sure, I'll do that. That seems like a good idea. You know, my mom and my dad said it was a terrible idea, but I am in because I am desperate to be part of my crowd. I am looking for my herd because I'm an adolescent. So this is just what we're up against when we're helping our teens. Third thing that happens with brain development is we lay down the final helmet. And the final cortex of the brain is where the dopamine receptors get laid down. It's why all addiction is a pediatric developmental disease as it happens during that time. Active there during this time is a naturally occurring neuroendocannabinoid called anandamide. We're not positive all that anandamide does, but we think it has to do with what gets pruned and what gets held on to. The problem with anandamide is that it is the mirror image of THC, or the psychoactive cannabinoid in marijuana. And your brain can't tell these two things apart. And in fact, the problem is that THC is even more potent than the naturally occurring anandamide. It's a giant bully molecule, and it gets in there, and it's like using a sledgehammer in your brain to determine what gets kept and what gets thrown away. Marijuana is a neurotoxic drug to the brain. I don't actually really care what you do in the privacy of your own home after the age of 25, as long as you are not on my roads, operating on my knee, changing the lug nuts on my tire. I don't think it's all that much worse than alcohol and the fully developed brain. But that's not who the industry is going after. You know that all addiction starts while the brain is developing. You know that. So if your job is to sell an addictive drug, who's your audience, right? Who are you guys selling to? You're not selling to me. I'm 50. You're never going to get me, right? You're targeting our kids. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, right? This is just a fact. They're going after our kids in very deceptive ways because their job is to make sure this young generation gets hooked on an incredibly potent drug. This is a neurodegrading drug, period, while the brain is developing. Nobody can convince me otherwise. And what we don't know about this drug um, far exceeds what we think we know. We need to start studying this stuff for real. Boy, it would have been nice to have studied this before we legalized it in Massachusetts in November of 2016. It's very distressing. Your town, by the way, has done an awesome job, partly due to Jody Hensley and other activists in this town, of saying no recreational pot in our town. Good for you. I'm super impressed with you. But many other towns in Massachusetts are struggling. So marijuana has an impact on attention, verbal learning, memory, processing speed, and that stays even when you're not high. This is this very well-known New, New, New Zealand study that followed people for 25 years, and I'm going to show you the two extremes, okay? Um, I'm going to compare the light gray bar to the bright red bar, and the light gray bar are teenagers who used marijuana zero times between the ages of 14 and 21. And I'm going to compare it to the red line where teenagers who used marijuana 400 times or more in that same seven year span. Now 400 times seems like a huge amount. I'm talking seven years, right? That's like using it once a week, twice a week, like kind of light use by comparison, right? So graduating from college by age 25, 36% of the people who use marijuana never graduated from college. 
Only 2% of those who used it 400 times or more graduated from college by age 25. Unemployment rates, not having a job by age 25. 21% of the kids who used marijuana zero times were unemployed by age 25. 52% of kids who used it 400 times or more were unemployed. I like my kids, I want them to leave my house. I want them to leave. I want them to pay taxes, I want them to walk their own dog, I want them to have their own job. I do not want them not to launch because they were using so much marijuana that they you know, got couch lock and cannot actually motivate to do anything. This is a performance degrading drug while your brain is developing. It's a performance degrading drug at any point, but it has the biggest impact at this stage. The same study showed an eight point drop in IQ. By age 35, an eight point drop in IQ, which is two standard deviations worse. That's a big drop. Now the problem with this study, it's based on the old pot. Right? These studies are all done on marijuana that's 3% THC. Where's that marijuana? It doesn't exist anymore. So you can't find a 3% marijuana anymore. Most of all the stuff grown in the fields is between 9 and 16% THC. That's what's grown now, right? Because other stuff doesn't exist. So when people are like, but I use marijuana in the 70s and 80s, it was fine for me. I'm like, I don't know what you were using, that's no longer available to us, right? It's like drinking a can of beer versus a handle of vodka. They're not the same drug anymore. And again, what we know about this is close to zero. So this is also how it looks, and this is often how it looks to our kids. It's earwax, shatter, butter, uh, hash oil. If you put a big fat rolled joint in front of the average 16-year-old, I actually think they wouldn't know what that was. This is what they know. You know what this is? This is between 50 and 90% THC. You think a 90% THC product is beneficial to your developing brain, right? How many IQ points do you lose with that stuff? I'm telling you, it's not good for our kids. This is what will be available at a store, not here, but in Framingham and Worcester, coming right down the street from y'all. A thousand ways you can get it in your system. You can rub it on your skin, you can smoke it, you can vape it, you can put it as a tincture under your tongue. Um, the most common way our kids get it is they eat it. And this is intended for our kids, right? This is not little old ladies with cancer that can't stop vomiting. They're not eating this. This is not what medical marijuana comes as, right? This is intended to target our kids. This is truly Colorado products. Massachusetts has a few more regulations. You're not allowed to do look-alike candy bars here. You're not allowed to have that Kit Kat or the Oreos, but it doesn't matter. If you wrap it in chocolate and sugar, kids know what that is, and it'll, be, it'll still be incredibly enticing. You're not allowed to have gummy animals in Massachusetts, but you can have gummy spheres and gummy cubes. I mean, seriously, kids are gonna eat them, right? So this is 70% of the market in Colorado are, are the edible candies. It's actually mandated that you have to sell edibles at the stores in Massachusetts. And the question that you guys said, well, they say it's not addictive, right? Well, we used to say marijuana had pretty low addiction rates. Compared to all the other addictive substances, marijuana used to be low. The biggest, besides sugar, which is the number one addictive substance we know, nicotine used to be number one. And the old marijuana at 3% THC was like 9% addictive. But when you started when you were a teenager, it was closer to 70%. Today's pot at the, at the uh, levels of THC that we're seeing, between 30 and 50% addictive, which makes it more addictive than nicotine. That's what we have. And it's everywhere, right? You guys know this. I'm not telling you something you don't know. It's in fact very heavily targeted to Worcester County at this point. Lots of the grow places, lots of the stores are in our world. Boston has been remarkably resistant about it coming in. Worcester County has been like, bring it on. Okay, 2017 was the first year that marijuana surpassed nicotine. Okay, let's talk about alcohol. I will not avoid alcohol. Um, I, I'm with the kids in saying that alcohol is harmful. It is harmful. A third of us in this country drink absolutely zero. We never ever drink anything. A third of us drink very lightly. Drink a week, a couple drinks a month, very light social drinkers. And the final one third of us drink every drop of alcohol in the country. And the final 10% of us drink at least 10 drinks a day. So theoretically, 10% of us in this room drink 10 drinks a day. Now I always say that and then I look around and I think most people who are drinking 10 drinks a day have started already, right? They're home, somewhere, at a bar, they've started because it takes a while to get 10 drinks in you. But the funny thing about 10 drinks is it seems like a big number. It doesn't take much time to get yourself to 10 drinks. So I want to remind you how drinks look. The average cocktail, a 1.5 ounces of hard liquor is considered a drink. So the average cocktail often has couple three of those, right? 
So you go to a bar, you have a mixed drink, you just had two or three drinks. And my point is you need to just know what you're drinking. You need to pay attention. And the biggest group of women, people struggling with alcohol are women. Because wine, the wine industry, the mommy's time out, the overwhelmed working mom world is drinking like we have never seen. And I say to my patients every day, tell me about your relationship to alcohol. And my women are like, you know, I have a couple drinks a night. I'm like, what are you drinking? I drink wine. How much do you pour? A normal size wine glass, right? And I'm thinking, yeah, right. So this is a glass of wine. It's five ounces. That's a class. And I say to them, I need you to put five ounces of water or whatever in your giant wine glass. And you need to acknowledge what you're drinking. Because my guess is you're drinking three glasses of wine every time you pour yourself a glass. And then I need us to just have a very non-judgmental conversation about why it is that you may be consuming six glasses of wine every night. What's that really about? Because it's not good for your health, right? I know what it's like to be a working mom, right? I know I have women in this room who got up at five and packed the lunch and walked the dog and filled out the school forms and paid the bills and then worked a 10 hour day and then come back home to a kitchen, to bread. My, my dinner from last night dishes are still gonna be in my sink. I have kids at home, right? And I'm gonna come home to a messy house. I know this, right? I know what that's like. And the message we send as adults to our kids when we walk in the door after a terrible day, a totally stressed out day, and the first thing they see us do is uncork that bottle of wine and pour ourselves a beer, is that the way to man is stress, the way to man is feelings of overwhelmness, the way to transition from work life to home life is to drink. That's the message you send. And more of us need to walk in and just say, I had a hard day, kind of losing it. I'm going to go for a walk. It's sunny out. I'm going to bring the dog out for a good long walk. You want to come? I'm going to go outside and my daffodils are up. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes staring at my beautiful daffodils that I've been waiting all hard winter for. Right? John Cabot's in. He's your local guy. I have him on my iPhone. Why don't I go sit on my yoga mat for 10 minutes and just quiet my brain down, right? That's positive messaging. That's positive stress management that we need to demonstrate as adults. So think about the last time you went or hosted an adult party where alcohol was a problem. It's always a problem. It doesn't have to be that way. I drink, but I've gotten super careful about how I drink these days because I'm just so aware of when I'm self-medicating. And lots of times I am, and it's not okay. If I think I need a drink, done. I don't get to drink that night. Okay, this I get all the time. Parents will say, but I want to teach my kid to drink. I want to show them how to drink well. I want to send them to college knowing what their limits are. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, did you just bring your 17-year-old out and teach them how to drink? They've done studies on this. When parents provide alcohol for their kids, all they do is create kids who are more high risk for alcoholism than binge drinking. You are not benefiting your kid by exposing them early. And then I get the people in the audience who are like, but how about in Europe? They drink at age 12 in Europe and they're all good. And I'm like, really? So when you go to the World Health Organization data and you look at the top, top 25 drinking countries, problematic drinking countries in the world, 23 of the top 25 are in Europe. South Korea and South Africa are on that list. Otherwise, those are all European countries. So the Europeans have not figured out drinking by exposing their kids early. They have not. It's not a beneficial drug while your kids is developing. Okay, I'm gonna spend a little time on this, not as much, just because of some age in this room, but I said there were three things that predispose to addiction. Genetics, early exposure while your brain is developing, and growing up in a household with a high ACE score or a lot of neglect and trauma is a very, um, predictive place that many of us arrive at addiction. So this is, who knows what the ACE score is in this room? Right, a lot of my people who are in the therapeutic or medical world know what this is. You guys know all about the ACE score. So this study came out in 1996. It was a study that was done in San Diego County, mainly middle-class white population, and it took 17,000 adults and it asked them 10 questions about what happened to them growing up in their household. And then they compared it to 56,000 Kaiser patients looking at chronic disease. And I'm not going to read every question. I'm going to read some of them, though, so you know what I'm talking about, okay? Did a parent or another adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you? Um, did you often, or do a parent or another adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you? Were you ever sexually abused? Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? Your family didn't look out for each other. Did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you, or that your parents were too drunk or too high to take you to the doctor if you were sick? Was there somebody in your household who was incarcerated? Was there somebody in your household with major mental illness? Were your parents separated or divorced? I covered most of them. 
you score a six or a higher out of a score of 10 on an A score, you've basically taken 20 years off your life. If you score a four or higher on an A score, you're a much higher risk for heart attacks, asthma, emphysema, multiple broken bones. You're, it's a very high predictor for who's gonna struggle with addiction and who's gonna struggle with chronic pain. I run a lot of chronic pain groups and, and I take care of a lot of people with chronic pain. They often have a very high risk score, right? Their sort of pathways of messaging to the brain about pain are through the roof. So this is a thing that our kids don't get to control. Our kids don't get to control their ACE score. It is a thing that teachers know, uh, that school nurses know, much more than actually a doctor knows, right? My, my teachers are adding up an ACE score. They're not even aware they're doing it, but they know things are falling apart for these kids at home. And this is a really harmful thing in our society, and it's a predictor of very expensive disease. And we as a society need to get better at helping these kids. We need to intervene more. We need much more financial support for kids in foster care. You should presume 100% of kids in foster care have an A score through the roof. And they need tons of support in order to have them be healthy adults. So three things, genetics, a history of childhood trauma, and early exposure. And the message you give to your kid is just delay your use as long as possible. Let's talk about it, talk about it often, and just delay your use. Don't ever smoke cigarettes, it's terrible for you. Bad for your skin, and many other things. Delay your use as long as possible. That's the message, okay? Now, what's the average age of first use? 14. Average age of first use, alcohol, nicotine, or marijuana, somebody said 20? 13. 12, 14. 12, 13, or 14. That's the average age. That is sixth, seventh, eighth grade. So if you think your first conversation is in 10th grade, what? This health educator here is not talking to these kids for the first time when they're in high school. This is like, this is a conversation starting way earlier than that, right? Here's a kindergarten lecture about drugs. If you find a pill on the ground, you get an adult immediately. Do not touch the pill, do nothing, you get an adult, right? Because you know what? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, three very commonly used blood pressure medicines will kill a five-year-old, period, right? So if there's a drug talk for a kindergartner. That's what it takes. Most of this other stuff, not quite the level you and I are talking tonight, but really good conversation should be starting in fifth grade about avoiding nicotine, stimulants, alcohol, right? If the first age is 12, 13, or 14, that's a fifth grade conversation. So our kids, I already told you, are fabulous. They're drinking at the lowest rates we've ever seen. They were gonna eradicate tobacco off the planet. I was thrilled with them. Illicit drug use is flat, and that's because of marijuana, but everybody knows that this thing came along. And I stole this slide, thank you very much, Jody. Um, this thing came along, and something happened in the summer of 2017, and you two look like, I'm looking at you because you're in my eyesight, but wanna get into college? This is your project right here. I need the forensics, of what went viral in the summer of 2017. Because something, like 12 things, went viral everywhere, and it had to do with vaping and jewelry and puffing out amazing, crazy animals into the sky with your vape smoke, and it was everywhere. And we had found vaping and e-cigarettes e and jewels in high schools for a while, but in September of 2017, they were everywhere. And we went from nothing to that. Uh, none of us in public health can remember anything that hit us this hard, this fast, and where we went from almost none to this giant spike. And it was all whatever went viral on social media in the summer of 2017. I just need somebody to do the diagnostics. I can't do it because I don't know how to do it. But that you guys in this room, my smart 15 to 18 year olds, you could figure it out and you guarantee you just got to college. So these rates of uh, how many kids are vaping are just through the roof. About a third of high schoolers in the last 30 days are vaping, about a third. And amazingly, in your district, you guys are actually about that. And I've been to school districts recently where the rates have been 60% of high school kids are vaping. Your numbers are actually really good in Westboro. I'm really proud of that, pleased with that. My hope is it stays that way and goes lower. <laughs> Um, Metro West in general, I was just asking Roger these questions, there are a lot of local towns and districts that are a lot higher, and you could probably predict that, right? This stuff's expensive, you need some money for this stuff, and the uh, more well-off school districts have, tend to have higher vaping rates in general, right? This is not an inner city problem, my friends. This is not a tiny little poor school district problem. These are people who have credit cards and access to a computer. So let's just remind ourselves what we're talking about, because when you ask the average 14-year-old, what do you think you're vaping, what do they say? Water. Flavor. Water. 
right? My 14 year old. She's like, it's just flavor and water, mom. You are so crazy. That's what she said to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, my brain just exploded. So this is a study that came out exactly a year ago, and it took 70 American-made e-juices that we made in this country, 90% of the market's from China, right? I'm not even talking about that stuff that is really not regulated. 70 products made in the US, all of which were labeled zero milligrams of nicotine. What percent of them had nicotine in them? 100? Between, 90%. 90% of these zero milligram products had nicotine in them, some of which had the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. They're just lying. They're just making it up, right? This is a 100% unregulated industry. You know what's in this? I don't know what's in this. There's formaldehyde. There's a bunch of other preservatives. I don't know what that does to the lungs. This is what I know as a doctor. Doctors in the 40s and 50s sat in their doctor's office smoking their cigarettes with a stethoscope around their lungs and said to patients on a day-to-day -day basis, smoking is good for you. It helps you breathe. Okay? Brought to you by the American tobacco industry. So what we used to not know about tobacco was pretty high, and now what we know is it's the number one cause of death. And I'm not saying that marijuana is that, but I am saying it remains a giant black box of the unknown. I'm sorry, not marijuana, but these products here. These are not flavor in water. This is flavor in water and four preservatives or 12 preservatives and nicotine that they're not even telling us about. So our kids are getting nicotine addicted and they don't even know what's happening to them. Two thirds of kids say, I had no idea there was nicotine in this stuff. But I guarantee you, there is. Because again, you're selling an addictive product, your job is to hook your young people. And it's nicotine that hooks your young people. And then you've got the flavors, right? There's 600 different flavors you can get. I just pulled up the ones that popped up on my screen. So little tiny apple juice boxes that look like the apple juice you send your five-year-old to school with, apple juice flavored e-cigarette juice. You get these ready whip cans that look just like a ready whip can. Nella wafer flavor. I'm like, you think an adult trying to quit smoking is using Nella wafer flavor? They're not. These are intended for kids. So if your job was to improve this, you would just do one thing. You would just say no flavors. I will ban flavored everything. That's all it's going to take, my friends, because nicotine itself is disgusting. <coughs> you get rid of the flavor, the kids won't use it. Why has that not happened? It just that's all that needs to happen. It and sometimes they ban the flavors, but it's gonna, so what Jody's saying is the fact. The federal government is not gonna do this. The state government maybe could do it, but at this point, the towns are gonna have to do it. We're just gonna have to say, we ban the flavors. We do not want these sold at our Cumberland farms and our gas stations, right? The problem is, you know, all of this is available online. That's the real problem, is that we can't shut off the online, so it has to be banned nationwide. The other thing I will say to you, again, my kids who are looking at getting into college, here's your other strategy, ready? I need you to go to all the local stores and I need you to operate a sting operation, right? I need my mature looking 17 year old to walk in and try to buy this stuff. Because what's the age legally you can buy this stuff in Massachusetts? 21 now, used to be 18, but now it's 21. So I need you, because you're mature, how old are you? Oh, she's mature looking, that would be great if they sold to a 15 year old, right there, okay. So we have a patrol car outside. I have somebody from the Department of Public Health sitting outside, right? And a school resource officer, somebody who keeps you safe. Your parents can hide in, in the corner. You try to go buy it. They sell it to you. First of all, I don't know, we take away their license. I don't know if we can do that, but we publicize it everywhere. Did you know that Cumberland Falls Farms sold to a 15-year-old? Unacceptable, right? Because they are. They're not IDing people. You think they ID people for this stuff? I don't believe it. So sting operation. That's a great thing. That's I love it. I want somebody to do it. And I want these I want these people to be publicly shamed for selling these products to our kids. But you guys said it already, you can buy it online everywhere. So the jewels did not lie. Okay, I'll give them credit for that. The jewels did not say we're just flavor and water. They said we're filled with nicotine. We're better than smoking a paper cigarette because we don't have 350 other cancer-causing agents in there. Um, this was started by two Stanford guys who both were smokers, and they thought in their heads they were doing something better. I don't believe any of that. I've become very cynical. These guys are every one of those little tiny refillable pods is equal to a pack of cigarettes, 200 hits. And the problem with jewels is they're much more addictive than a pack of cigarettes. So when you smoke a cigarette, most of the nicotine is in the first one-third of the cigarette. The other two-thirds has a little bit, but it goes down as you go. Not with a jewel. You get an even hit of nicotine the entire way through, and they combine it with, with salt, so it's much less harsh feeling. 
And it's very smart. The technology behind it is very smart. It's measuring how much you're breathing in because it's using like smartphone technology. So it's figuring out how you're dosing yourself. And maybe it's gonna dose you a little bit more because you don't intake enough. Like this thing is working super hard to make you addicted. And I guarantee you, I got a certain percent of my kids who go to this school who are absolutely addicted to nicotine. They cannot get through an eight hour school day because they're in nicotine withdrawal, which means they're out vaping in the bathroom, they're vaping in the parking lot, because they have to, because they're in nicotine withdrawal, right? That's just the way it is. There's not a single tobacco cessation product approved under the age of 18. You go to the average pediatrician, they're like, uh, I don't know, I've never prescribed the patch, the gum, the Nicotrol inhaler, because it's not my job normally to do that. It's really hard to get these kids off this stuff. Super addictive and really cool. Like this is a cool, smooth, awesome feeling device. You know, when I opened, I got myself an iWatch uh, about six months ago. I don't buy myself a lot. I was super excited. And I opened and closed the box. It came in like 12 times because it was so cool and smooth. It was like no box I'd ever used. That's how these guys come. They're really impressive. Uh, so this is a company called PAX. And I was asking Jody this question when she walked in. But PAX is the original company these two Stanford guys made. This is straight THC. This stuff is interchangeable and can be inserted into these cartridges. So yeah, we have nicotine addiction with all of these smart e-cigarettes, but then more worrisome to somebody like me is you have these pods that are just actually filled with the psychoactive cannabinoid that's in marijuana called THC. So your kids are walking into school high as kites and nobody knows, right? And this is now often the new normal. And I guarantee you it is happening. Do I think it's happening at super high rates in this high school? I don't know. It's happening at super high rates in many high schools. And some school resource officers test them, right? You can test to see whether it's marijuana or nicotine. I don't know what's happening here. But it's really helpful. And I, I guarantee you in the next two years, this is going to become more prevalent. And if I told you that many 10th graders or 8th graders were walking into your high school drunk every day with several nips in their pocket, everybody in this room would be freaked out. I know that. But I'm telling you, we have that many kids walking in high as kites, and that's not any better. It's not, we're not, in, this is not a good public health thing for our kids. Uh, okay, let's talk about phones for, I'm not gonna spend tons of time because I wanna get to questions, but this is a great article, it was 2017 September in the Atlantic Monthly, just talking about screens. Who read this article? Let me read this one. You read it? What, did you think it was good? I only read it. It was really good. It was really good. What'd you say? It took a long time to get there, it's a long article. It's a long article. It was upsetting. My, both my husband and I were reading it at different sides of the house, and we both freaked out. And then we realized we were like the worst parents on earth because it's really hard to control your kids' smartphones, right? Okay. So uh, half of teenagers in the U.S. and Japan think they're addicted to their smartphone. About half this room of adults think they're addicted to their smartphone, right? So this is one of the biggest arguments that parents and teenagers have. 72% of teens and 48% of parents feel the need to immediately respond to a text or a posting. Almost three quarters of our kids, I looked at my daughter this morning, she comes down, she always has that phone, it's glued to her palm, right? She sits down, I'm asking her a question or five questions, her head is down, she's just staring at her phone, so shoveling cereal in, and I'm like, can you put your phone down, put it down, and talk to me? And she puts it down, she puts her hand on top of it, and I said, do you have to touch it? Seriously, do you have to have your hand on it? And she's like, I'm just resting my hand on it, and I'm thinking, wow. She's a 15-year-old, and that is that group right there. I have a 21. He's not addicted to his phone. But this, this generation, this young generation that grew up with that iPhone glued to their palm, man, we have some problems ahead of us. Um, it is really a third of parents and teens say they argue daily about their smartphones. Every day they have an argument. That's, I fall in that category. Um, so 56% of parents admit that they check their devices while driving. I do that, I'm embarrassed as hell that I do it. I'm on call 24 seven, it's a giant excuse though, right? They can, I have, a, I have a way to speak to my car without having to touch my phone. I know how to do that, but a lot of us touch our phones. These are the signs of addiction. You have compulsive use, you have continued use despite harm, you have cravings. There are people in this room who have not touched their phone for the last hour and change, but you've been thinking about it. Some of you have felt a buzz that may or may not be real. But your brain is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I know this, this happens to me. And you have a loss of control. That defines addiction. It just does. So there are many of us, teenagers and adults, who have an addiction to their phone. And again, this week coming up, when you get rid of your devices, I'm in on this plan. I love the fact the school is doing this. So um, 
The thing about it is that there's a tremendous amount of dopamine associated with your phone, right? I just, I thought my kids sent this to me. I was like, show me what your Instagram, what is this stuff, Snapchat stuff looks like. Just send me a screenshot, loves. And they get, you know, they'll say to me, Mom, you didn't heart my Instagram posting. And I think to myself, I don't even know what you're talking about, right? I follow them on Instagram to make sure they're not doing something horrible, but they're always bothered that I don't give them a little dopamine spike with that little like, right? Because every time you get one of those little likes, it's a tiny little dopamine spike. And it's, it's so enforcing. These screens are designed to want you to come back for more. So we all know this, and in fact, the heads of these smartphone companies would say themselves, I would never get one of these things for my own kid, right? We know that this is not good for our kids. Um, let's switch to opiates for a minute, because if you don't think there's an opiate problem, you're living under a rock, and there's an opiate problem everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in Westboro, it's in Northboro, it's in Worcester, it's in Boston, it's everywhere. There's not one town that's worse. There's no doubt that the overprescribing of pills over the last 25 years begat this problem. We can all acknowledge that. This country prescribed more opiates than any other country in the world for pain, right? By a long shot. You think Canadians are any different than we are? We're the same as the Canadians. They have warmer coats, they like coffee coats. We're the same people, but they prescribe, we prescribed a lot more opiates. When you look now, you know, there's more deaths from opiates than car accidents, from AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic, from gun violence. The number one cause of death under the age of 50 is death by opiates. That's where we have gotten to today. And guess what? It's not getting better. It's in fact getting worse. That's where we are also today. And it's really, for those of us who've been in neck deep for the last 10 years, boy, it's uh, demoralizing to know that we actually aren't getting better. So this is the nation starting in 2003. And these red areas are where people are starting to die. And you watch the country to, till it ends in 2014. And look how red the country is in 2014. Fentanyl hits us. In 2016, fentanyl is a 100% synthetic opiate, mostly made in China, a little bit of it is made in Mexico, and it gets mailed to us. That doesn't arrive until 2016. At this point, the nation is deep maroon. The entire country, with the exception of North and South Dakota, are lit up. Most of the pills that came to New England came to us uh, from I-95. We used to call it Oxy Highway. There were two, 650 pill mills in Florida. We would send buses down to Florida, and you would have no diagnosis, you would have no medical problem, and all you needed was a stack of cash, and you would walk into one of these pain clinics, and you would be handed a bag of pills and a stack of scripts, which you handed back to your tour operator who went back to Massachusetts and Maine and Kentucky and sold them all. This happened for 10 or 11 years. And in 2009, 2010, the federal government looked at Florida and said, holy smokes, you have destroyed the eastern seaboard. We're cutting you off. No federal highway funds, no airport funds, no school funds, because you're destroying the country. Stop. And the FDA, the DEA went in. They shut these places down. 34 doctors went to federal prison. They were doctors trained in this country, licensed in the country. They were drug dealers, making tens of millions of dollars a year, addicting people to opiates. So the problem is, that I got 2.5 million Americans up and down the eastern seaboard addicted to opiates, and I just cut off my main supply. The year's 2010, what are you left with? Yeah, you're left with heroin. You're left with an unbelievably pure and cheap and incredibly available drug. It is everywhere. I can text somebody, I can get as much heroin as I want in four minutes in this lobby. It's very easy to get. Now, not for all of us instantly, but it won't take you long how to figure out how to do it. So this drug is cheap and it's deadly. We weren't ready for this. I wanted Florida to get shut down. I was a huge supporter of it, but I was not prepared for 2010 and 2011 and 2012 to hit New England and the Appalachian area and we began to see people die. So below map is before Florida gets shut down. That's where overdoses in the red happened a lot. The above map is when Florida shuts down. And again, Florida needed to get shut down. The pills are harmful, the pills killed some people, nothing kills you like heroin, and now these days, fentanyl. So this was a public health disaster that needed, I guess, to happen, but we were not ready for treatment. Um, in 2016 is when fentanyl arrives, that's that line that says synthetic opiates, and that's really what's killing you. So 90% of the heroin in Massachusetts is fentanyl positive. Now, I had a kid in my office yesterday, and he's like, I haven't seen heroin in over a year. I look for heroin, because I, I don't like the fentanyl, and I'm like, I hear you, but he's like, there's no more heroin. It's all gone. And I'm like, I know. And it's mixed. It's all mixed together. And this is the amount of, heroin, of fentanyl it takes to kill you. Right? That's it. 
There are many, many deaths with cocaine mixed with fentanyl. People who say to me, I only use cocaine, I don't know how I have this in my urine. I'm like, because you don't know, but you're using fentanyl too. And you're thinking this is harmless, but I'm telling you, you may die. So I don't normally do this, but you're a cocaine user who needs Narcan. It doesn't make sense, but it makes sense today. This stuff is mixed in with marijuana now. It's mixed in with everything. It doesn't make sense. If your job is to sell a drug, why do you kill your client? But if all your job is is to really expand your market, that's their goal, they don't really care who they kill. This is what we're fighting against now. So how did your kids get opiates? In the old bad days, your kids used to rifle through your medicine cabinet or your, or your mother's medicine cabinet and steal the pills. Those days should be behind us. Saturday is National Drug Take Back Day in the country, and every police station in any good state, like our great state, has a police drop take back box for all drugs. If you have medicine at your house that is abusable, a stimulant, uh, Xanax, Valium, lorazepam, any opiate, if you're actively using it, it should be under lock and key, period. If you're not actively using it and you're holding it for a rainy day, get rid of it. Because that is a 2012 conversation. I don't ever want to have to have that conversation. I'm done with it. Your kids get exposed to opiates when they're injured. They get a femur fracture, they have an appendectomy, they get their wisdom teeth out. And the clinician looks at you and hands you a script. Now what you need to do as a loving adult is to look at the clinician and say, I would like to manage my kids' pain. I would like to limit or not expose them to opiates while doing so. Talk me through my plan, please. These days in Massachusetts, most clinicians will say, okay, here's our plan. Plan A, we're going to use Tylenol plus Motrin in combination. Plan B is we're going to use distraction. Let's talk about it. Ice, heat, a roller, watch TV. They do surgery in Boston with like virtual reality goggles. They're putting tubes in kids' ears. The kids are chasing, you know, like a dinosaur through the jungle on their virtual reality goggles. How awesome is that, right? It's doable stuff. So our job as adults is to protect our kids. Now, you don't want your kid to suffer. Plan C is how to judiciously use an opiate at the lowest level possible that the adult always manages. Your kid get their wisdom teeth out, you have to stay home from work. Sorry, it's just the way it is. Kids can't manage their own pain pills, no way. That's the way it used to roll. So if you love somebody who you think struggles with addiction, you need to have Narcan available to you. Narcan, also called Naloxone, is available without a prescription at every pharmacy by state mandate in Massachusetts. Just walk in, say, I need Narcan, it's none of their business why you need it, and it theoretically runs under your insurance. Sometimes the copay is hot. Um, people get better with addiction. It doesn't always happen fast enough. It doesn't always happen on your schedule. It doesn't ever happen on my schedule. To get better from addiction, you need everything going your way is the hard part. You need stable, sober housing. You cannot go back and live with your old girlfriend who's still using and think you're gonna get better. No way it doesn't work. And we can acknowledge it won't work. You can say that you're doing that, I'll see you again. And here's Narcan, and I really don't want you to die. And, and that's just the way it's gonna be. We do not have enough sober, sober housing in this state or in this country. And if somebody comes to Westboro and says, I'd like to build, or take over a house and put six women who are trying to get better in their addiction, please support that. Please say that's a good thing in our community because you know who they are? They're your kids and nieces and they're your neighbors and they need a place to go where they can be safe. And we need to be supporting this as a community. It outrages me when people say, I don't want that in my backyard. It is in your backyard now. Let's help people get better. I believe in medicine for addiction. I believe in methadone. I believe in buprenorphine. I believe in naloxone. I believe in anything it takes now track some to get better. AA meetings, NA meetings can help people, good therapy, trauma treatment, having a sense of purpose, feeling like I have something to do with my life. Going to jail does not rebuild dopamine in your brain. People get better, but it takes time. It takes 15 months, it takes 20 months. When you're locked up in a solo cell in a jail and you have one hour of sunshine every day and no exercise and no sense of purpose and eating crappy food and getting fat, your dopamine is not rebuilding in your brain. And you know who those people are? They're your next door neighbor and they're coming home in six months. It would be really nice if they got better before they came out. I'm telling you, Massachusetts as of today's report has the lowest incarceration rates in our country. I'm super proud of that. But this country has the highest incarceration rates in the world. And even though we're the lowest in Massachusetts, we still exceed most every other country in the world. Locking people up for addiction is not the right path. It costs $58,000 a year to incarcerate somebody in a county prison. What could you do with $58,000? A lot. Okay, these are great books on addiction. 
If you thought to yourself, wow, that was kind of interesting, I want to learn more, any of these books would be good. This book called Hey Kiddo is written by a great Worcester guy, right? He grew up right here in Worcester. Um, his mom was a heroin addict. He was ra raised by his grandparents. It's salty. It is not intended for 12-year-olds. It, it's fine for 15-year-olds. Um, it's a graphic novel. It's intended, actually, for teenagers. I really like that book. He lives, he lives actually, in Northampton now. Um, if you are in the healthcare field, the helping field, the counseling field, you're a teacher, you're a doctor, the book up there called The Body Keeps the Score is the best book on trauma and what it does to the brain and the body that I've ever read. You need to read it. It is a critical book. It has changed the way I am as a doctor. Um, but all these books are good. I'm going to leave that slide up. I have a website. It was posted earlier. It's just my name, bigpoti.com. But on my website, I have this talk. I change my talks all the time. I add new slides. I change things. I changed this talk this week. Um, but I also have on articles, things I read. I do a lot of jail work. Um, I have a lot on, on what should be happening in jail, so I post those things there. So that's a, a website that's helpful. Okay, what questions do people have? And Kelly, you need a mic because it's getting recorded, right? So Kelly's going to run around with the mic so we can catch the sound. The packs, pods that are marijuana, do those have a smell? I have to say, I don't know the answer to that question. Do they have a smell? My guess is they're flavored in a positive way to mask the smell. Um, but I actually don't know. I mean, this is, this is really new stuff. We're on the verge of this stuff really being active. In general, what we're finding is the replacement pods or juices that are going into the vape products that are THC positive smell good the way they all smell good. I don't know who's ever walked into the bathroom these days, but it is filled with 27 unbelievably potent, perfumey smells that come from these things. I, I mean, my, my kids here will say, it's hard to go into a public bathroom anymore. Kids don't, often kids don't like the bathroom anyway, right, because it's public, but it's so hard to go into these vaping bathrooms because they're sort of toxic with smell, right? So uh, they're very deceptive is what I would say. They will be easily integrated into a school without people knowing. They don't smell like normal pot smells. Yep. You talked about the uh, dopamine spike and chasing that spike to feel normal. Yep. You talked about it in the context of opiates, meth, and alcohol. Can you address that same pattern in the context of marijuana? Yeah, I mean, it, it all does it, right? It all, you feel bad. When you are withdrawing from marijuana, this is what withdrawal <laughs> symptoms look like. Profound anxiety and insomnia. You feel terrible. And in fact, the interesting thing is a lot of people start using marijuana to help them with their anxiety and their insomnia. And then lo and behold, you stop using it and you can't sleep and you're crawling out of your skin because those are the withdrawal symptoms. So you think to yourself, I've got to keep using it, right? So uh, the spikes are there. Can I give you a number, the way I give you numbers, right, for dopamine? Um, I can't really. It's somewhere lower than cocaine, but it doesn't matter. It's there. It's, it's higher than your Instagram like, I'll say that much. And again, coming off of it is really challenging. And the withdrawal time of those symptoms going away takes months. The number one admission for adolescents for addiction is marijuana, right? It's not opiates it's, or alcohol. It's absolutely marijuana by a large margin. Um, are there any warning signs for parents to know if their kids are using any kind of um, e-cigarettes or something? How do they know if they are using or not? Yeah, okay, so that's a great question. So first of all, you need to know what these things look like. And I can't, I mean, I'm looking at you, at you Kelly. Have you guys done a juuling, vaping demonstration here of what everything looks like that's been collected? The school resource officer will often show the last six months of product. Sent a letter here was sent home. Now this is a fast-moving industry, and so one of the problems, the Juul, as an example, the little pod is rechargeable on your computer, and it looks just like a USB. And for the first couple years, everybody thought it was a USB memory stick, and then they realized, oh, that isn't what that is. It's actually recharging their e-cigarette. So this is a fast-moving industry where it keeps changing its literal shape. You need to know what these things look like, so when you're cleaning out your kid's book bag, you pick it up and are like, holy smokes, that's what that is. 
Now, I don't go through my kids' book bag every day, but I actually do go through them. There's rotten food in there. They're super disgusting. There's, I never get like reports from school. Like They just don't hand them to me. So I'm fishing through their book bags, and I am looking for that. The smell, they have amazing, like strong smells with them. If your kid is routinely smelling like that, there is something going on. Nicotine addiction withdrawal has a lot of agitation and anxiety associated with it. Um, so if you're seeing that, that would be a concern, but it's really finding the device. And if you're in nicotine withdrawal, you can't make it a couple hours without using it. So they can't be home at your house for eight hours straight without using it. And guess what, as hard as it is, you actually have to go into your kids' rooms. I hate going to my kids' rooms. Like they're gross, I get mad at them every time I walk in. There's always food in there, which they're not supposed to have, but I try to go in their rooms and I, that, that um, hidden in plain sight, for you who haven't seen it, you need to go see hidden in plain sight because it looks like a normal room. And then you start looking around and you're like, holy smokes, this kid is using marijuana and they're vaping and they actually may be using worse than that. So that's one of my answers, but there's lots of very smart people in this room who also know a lot about that subject. In case people haven't seen it already, there's a table outside with a lot of examples of different products. Right, the, hid, the hidden plain sight area is out there. So make a point of stopping there. And I don't know if, I've had school resource officers create boards, because what are they gonna do with all the stuff they collect? They're not gonna, I don't know, they glue it to a board and they bring it for parents to see. And again, every six months, the stuff totally changes how they look. So it's hard to stay on top of, it's high tech stuff. And I wanna say something about that. Buying online, you need a credit card. Just saying. And um, I don't know how many of your kids own their own credit card. I don't know that. Many of our kids don't, right? But they get a gift card from grandpa for 50 bucks from American Express, right? That happens all the time. Do I ever know what my kids have really done with that? Not always, I don't really know. Most of the time I think they lose them. But I try now to pay attention to what happens to that because 50 bucks will buy you a jewel. My kids have bank accounts now with a debit card because they have jobs and I, thought I my name is on their bank account and I, I look at everything they buy. That's the best I can do right now is I follow what they purchase. And so pay attention to that. Kelly, other ones? Okay, thanks, you guys. If you want this talk, because you're going to go give it, you talk to Kelly, she'll maybe collect email addresses. Sorry, Kelly. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I have the uh, privilege and honor of being the incoming president of the Rotary Club of Westboro. And uh, why we are here is we are a service organization. Uh, we're worldwide with a million two members in 200 co countries. And our motto is service above self. Uh, one of the areas of focus that we're engaged in is in disease prevention. And back in 2013, 2014, Rotary recognized that uh, addiction and substance use issues uh, were in fact a disease and decided to form a group to address that to bring resources to communities to help sponsor programs like this. So that's, that's why we're here tonight. Um, I'd like to uh, also thank uh, a couple of our uh, town uh, officials who are here, uh, Shelby Marshall and Syed Hashmi are, uh, from the Board of Selectmen. And, um, you saw here tonight will be available on Westboro TV. So if you want to see it again, it's uh, please uh, look for it there. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors and particularly our presenting sponsor, Central One Federal Credit Union, without whose financial support we wouldn't be able to host and support programs like this. And also uh, Westboro Connects, Westboro Youth and Family Services, and the Westboro Public Schools, with whom we've partnered over the last year or so to bring these presentations to the community. And please look for more of them next year as we get into the school year uh, in September. So thank you all for coming. I think it's an important topic, and we appreciate uh, your interest. Uh, if anyone is interested in becoming involved with this effort, uh, contact Westboro Connects, contact Westboro Rotary. We'd love to have your involvement. Thank you.